Hello and welcome to a brand new Arse Blog Arsecast right here on arseblog.com. How are you? As always, I hope you and yours are safe and sound, keeping well, and uh, and everything's okay in your world. It's been a bit of a slog, really, this week, or this last couple of weeks, I have to say, because of the interlull, an interlull in which we're hoping some of our players, not all of them, of course, but some will have recharged their batteries, they're ready to go, but man... It just felt a bit overwhelming at times, didn't it? Well, maybe it didn't for everyone else. It did for me. Still a lot going on in general around here, and uh, there were times in this last week where I was just like, ah, I wish I could go to the top of a mountain and just scream. I know it's a bit of an old trope, but uh, I did really genuinely feel like doing that one day this week. It was all just, oh, Christ. But unfortunately, because of the travel restrictions here in Ireland, we're still not allowed to go more than 5k from home. I can't even get close to the top of a mountain. There isn't even a substantial hill in the neighborhood, so I've kind of had to live vicariously through one of the dogs, one of the Arsblog German Shepherds. Lana, who is now coming up on... Oh, she is. She's gone three. She's three years of age at this point. Has been everywhere. In good times, she go to the Phoenix Park. We go to the sea. We go to the seaside. We go to the mountains. All of these incredible places. But her favorite place in the entire world is the very small park about 200 yards up the road from my house. She, every time we go to go there, loses her shit completely. And even more so, if, as we're going there, Archer goes on the other side of the road to go to the park before she does. Now, this week, very sadly, we lost one of the great actresses, great comedic actresses, Jessica Walter, who many of you know from Arrested Development. And one of the... uh, Also, she was the mother in Archer, which is where Archer and Lana get their names from, but that's a different story. But one of the running gags in Arrested Development was every time she would uh, encounter her private detective, Gene Parmesan, somehow she wouldn't recognize him, and then he'd reveal himself to her, and she would scream. Uh, An example. Gene Parmesan, Lucille Bruce. My son is trying to get me out of my house. I think he may be up to something. Oh, hold on, that's probably him. Gene? It's just some idiot with balloons. Oh, is it? <laughs> the point of this is that Lana, when <laughs> when we're going to that park does an uncanny impression of the scream of Jessica Walter from Arrested Development. This is genuine audio footage of us going to the park today. See if you can pinpoint the moment when Archer crosses the road. Suffice to say, pretty much everyone in the neighborhood knows when it is that we're going out for a walk. So Lana can continue to do my screaming until such time as I can get to the top of that particular mountain. Right, we've got a show for you today. Obviously, we're playing Liverpool uh, at the weekend, tomorrow, Saturday evening, depending on when you're listening to this. And uh, a bit later on, we'll get some Liverpool perspective from Neil Atkinson from the Anfield Wrap. Uh, Before we do that, though, it's been a big week for the Arsenal women. Uh, with the announcement that manager, uh, head coach rather, Joe Montemoro is to step down at the end of the season. So to get a bit more on that and what might be happening in terms of finding a replacement, the process for all that and more, who better to talk to than Tim Stillman? Hi, Tim. Hello there. So is it a surprise in any way that this announcement has come and Joe has made the decision that he's made? It's a so I don't think the decision is a surprise. The announcement was a surprise um, and it was an unpleasant surprise to me because it was the only period of the week where I was out of the house <laughs> and not able to actually do anything to deal with it um, on the site. But the, the decision is not a huge surprise to me. Um, the, the fact that the announcements come now, I can't pretend I was expecting that. Um, ultimately, Um, I I spoke to Joe about this yesterday. He said he made the decision in February. Um, Reading between the lines there, in February, Arsenal lost to Manchester City and Chelsea in the same week. And this has been one of the big question marks over his reign over the last year or two. Um, The the kind of the 
consistent defeats in these big games. And I, I think he probably just came to a point where um, he lost those two games in one week and just thought, OK, I, I don't really have an answer to this anymore. Um, what, what I will say is that I think um, this is going to sound really, really derogatory and I don't mean it to. So when I say good on him, um, I'm I'm incredibly sad to see Joe go because I think he's a really good coach and he's a really, really good man as well. I do think it's the right time. He had um, two years left on his contract. He could easily, I think, have sat on that. I don't detect that there was a great desire to move him on, but I think he realises that this is quite a good time to hand this over. The squad is actually in really good shape. Mm. Um, he's done. He's made some really good moves. The age profile of the squad is brilliant. The oldest player is Kim Little, who is 30. Everyone is between 21 and 28, more or less. Um, it's, a, it's a good squad. It's a really talented squad. It's a balanced squad. And uh, I, I do just think there are a couple of questions there over management of injuries and performance in the big games. And yeah. I think he's just kind of come to a stage where he's thought, OK, I, I don't really have any answers to this anymore. Good time to hand over to someone else. Sure. Um, and I, th I think he's done he's done pretty right by the club in doing that. And I think in that respect as well, he gets to walk away with his head held high, especially if Arsenal go on to get this last Champions League spot, which... To, just to reiterate in closing, um, Arsenal women is not Arsenal men. This is a squad who are capable of, of challenging for and winning the league. And they've fallen quite a long way short of that this season. So even if they go on and finish third, that, that is not, that's the very bare minimum. Yeah. Um, really, that's that's not success for Arsenal women um, who are a massive club um, in Europe who have yeah. underperformed this season. So, so when you talk about the timing of it being a little bit of a surprise, is it a, you know, is it from the perspective of well you know wh when a coach whether he's in charge of a women's team or a, a man's team or whatever if he announces his departure and he stays in charge there's a sort of fear that you know as a dead man walking so to speak mm. players might not respond to what the manager or the coach does on the training ground and in matches because they're looking at this guy and thinking uh, well, you know, you're not going to be here next year, so blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. You know, which I think is probably more of an issue in the men's game, I would imagine, given that, you know, there are probably uh, bigger egos and bigger things at play in them yeah. in, in, in those squads. Um, or, or is there, a, you know, is there a sense that because of the the connection that the players have with Joe and how popular he is and how well-liked he is, that this might in some way... Uh, galvanize them and consolidate them for that push towards the the Champions League place. I, th I think it's very much the latter, and and since they lost those two games, so I mean, really, it's the the culmination of Joe's reign. They they can't quite win those games, and they should. They you know they shouldn't win all of them, mm. but they should do better than they've done. Um, but they lost those two games. But since then, they've won four in a row without conceding a goal. So they're actually on a really good run at the moment and they've got five games left um which all of which they'll be favorites for and if they win them all they're in the champions league so i think i think he's been um smart in terms of doing it now because they've got five very winnable games they're on a good run and i think he's thinking okay let's just um you know the the, the players know i'm not going to be here next season but they know they've got a fight to get in the champions league next year mm. And, and I do think it will probably, I mean, I say reinvigorate that they are playing well and they're on a good run. I do think it's a kind of right five games left. Um, let's get this over the hill. And, and like you say, he is um, with most of the players, very popular. He's, he's, He's a, he's a very, very nice man. Mm. Um, and the, the thing he has done outstandingly in this job is taking the points in the games where Arsenal should take the points. They've only dropped um, points against a team outside of the top four once in three years. Um, they win those games and they win them well because they prepare well for them. So I think he's probably just taken a little bit of distance and thought, OK, um, we got the kind of the trauma of the Chelsea Man City defeats out the way. It's a very clear objective. There's a few games left. Let's, you know, perhaps give this a bit of a boost. I also think, and he explained yesterday that he felt that it was fair on Arsenal as well to give them yeah. time to find a successor. 
um, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But um, some of the people involved in that are going to be very, very busy this summer on the men's side as it is. So I think also he's done right by the club in just giving them this kind of period to to really scout his successor. Yeah, before we get into talking about that, um, which is interesting because the last time you were on and we were speaking about this, I, I think I was asking about like, well, who who is going to make that decision or how are those decisions made? We do have a little bit of clarity on that, but we'll come to it in a moment. But just overall, um, you know, what will Joe's legacy be and his his mark on the club be uh, for the period of time that, that he's been in charge? I mean, I know that, you know, it's kind of coincided with um, a growth in the women's game in general, so there's a bit more profile on it. And I think, you know, without wanting in any way to blow smoke up your arse, the, the coverage that you've provided and given uh, the women's team on Arse Blog News and on the, the dedicated section that we have there for the women's team has, has increased, has helped really increase the profile and awareness of the team among, among Arsenal fans. So, you know, is he somebody who will be even if there were some issues with you know the performance in the big games and maybe a sense that they could have won more is he somebody mm. whose legacy will be overwhelmingly positive i i think so and look i i'll lay my biases on the table i i like joe i can like we get on so um, but I, I think so. I think um, I think the way he's built the squad is really good. I, th- I think the squad, and that's what's made this season so disappointing. Actually, mm. is I think this squad is really good. Um, like no squad is perfect. There are probably one or two things that um, probably need doing to it, but not really that much. Whoever takes this job is getting a really, really good um, crop of players at a really good age. The thing is, as well, that it's quite easy to overlook was that Arsenal went into a big transitional period before Joe and they appointed Pedro Loza who was yeah. a, a decent coach but it didn't he we were a cup team um under Pedro um and he, he couldn't quite get us back into that that top echelon Joe has done that everybody talks about the WSL probably now as a big four but but certainly as a big three and it is just without question that Arsenal are in are, are in that and they're not inconsistent a bit like they were under Pedro and have surprise results and things like that. Like he is, I think he gave the club its confidence back in terms of being an elite team. Obviously he was, uh, you know, he oversaw a league title and the first one in seven years. That's a very long time to wait mm. for a team like Arsenal women. That's um, that that's kind of a big trauma for a team who are used to winning it every single year. And I think he just really came in and just put Arsenal back into that, that, definite confirmed we are one of the elite teams and I think he really just gave the whole club and the players their confidence back in that respect Um, I think some of the issues that are there around you know perhaps management of big games management of injuries I don't think they're enormous tasks for a new manager to turn around I really don't I don't think that I think the next person is is, is I think this is a really attractive job, not just because of the brand that Arsenal women are, but like you say, with this explosion of interest um, and and the number of eyeballs on the women's game, Arsenal, Arsenal are still firmly in that elite bracket. And you look at a team like Liverpool, for example, who've been relegated, um, aren't going to be promoted from the championship this year, you know, really lost their way. Arsenal have, um, you know, very much kept up with the Joneses of Manchester City and Chelsea in a way that the men haven't been able to. Um, Obviously, that's not guaranteed going forward, but um, I I think it's a squad that I would put up against. Certainly Man City's, Chelsea, you know, frankly, they've just got a few more players. Theirs is just slightly bigger, but I I would put Arsenal in Manchester, uh, Arsenal in Manchester, you know, in that bracket in terms mm. of quality. And I think a, a lot of that is down to Joe. And just the the seriousness and professionalism, I, I reference their record against the teams, you know, below them in the table. It's it's virtually impeccable. And that's that speaks to the seriousness and the professionalism with which they they um they prepare for those games and 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 yeah and they played look they played really great football as well at times. They mm. played really entertaining, kind of fast passing you know, quite total football um, style, and it's and and on their day, it's still really, really good to watch, and and I think that's important as well. Mm. Well, the job is is has been advertised already, mm. um, 
And, you know, like I said, we spoke about who makes the decisions and who is in charge and, and how how things are going to go. And, and it was quite interesting to see that uh, around the announcement of Joe's departure, there was also um, an interview with the chief executive, Vinay Venkatesham, uh, who says... Uh, bum, 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 where is it here? In terms of the process, there'll be a few of us involved to find Joe's replacement. We'll still have the management of Arsenal Women, our people director, our technical director, Edu, and of course, I'll be involved in the process. And I think another aspect of this, which is quite interesting, and maybe you can just touch on them separately in the answers, is he says, at the same time as that process uh, to find the replacement, we're also undertaking a full and thorough uh, review of Arsenal Women, which is already well progressed. That review is about looking at absolutely everything we do, thinking about how we can get even better, thinking about how in the right areas we can invest even more to ensure we have the best opportunity uh, to be successful on the pitch. So, um, you know, are you are you heartened by that public commitment to uh, the team? And, and what do you make of, um, you know, the process of finding that replacement? You know, it's sort of rare, isn't it, to see... Mm. I know the, it's probably different for the women's game, but, you know, to see a position of that stature advertised so openly, I mean, does that show that they're... They're they're really open to finding all kinds of candidates, or because yeah. it isn't necessarily that there's a you know an outstanding candidate that they have their eye on. Yeah, so in in the women's game, there are fewer like super coaches. There aren't many Guardiola and Klops. I, the reason, so advertising the job um, is is absolutely um, is absolutely normal. The England Lionesses job was advertised as well, and this is largely because they they will be open to candidates from the men's game as well. Jo, Joe mm. actually um, came from Melbourne City men's team. He managed the women's team, and then he went to the men's team, and then he came to Arsenal. So they'll be open to those kind of candidates who are maybe a candidate who is currently in the men's game or who has been in the men's game. Um, But yeah, there there aren't many, you know, absolutely stellar kind of coaches um, in the women's game who who are probably not already in in kind of big jobs. So even a team like Lyon, nobody cares who the Lyon coach is. They change their coach all the time. They've got such good players that I could coach them. It's, it's kind of fine. <laughs> so there, there aren't those kind of real super coaches um, in, in the women's game. Also, I think um, what we've kind of got to acknowledge here is that Edu, and what, the reason I'm really interested in this, among, for many reasons, but... Vinay, Edu, they they don't have experience of this type of appointment. Um, Pedro Loza and Joe were big time Ivan appointments. And because Ivan had um, that exposure in America, he he actually, he knew his way around this because of his time in the US, where of course women's football is um, is probably superior to the men's product. So, you know, he he got Pedro like he he knew Pedro Loza before he approached him, and and Joe was working in the City Group um, in Melbourne, and and Ivan had those connections. I, I'm not sure that that Vin I and Edu do. Um, so that that's going to be interesting. I'm glad they're tendering it though, and I. I don't want them to just go for like so for example the the former u.s women's national team coach joe uh uh jill ellis rather mm. joe, i've got joe on the brain um, at the moment <laughs> jill ellis she she's available um and she's actually english she was born in portsmouth but i mean that that to me uh, like i don't actually think she's a stellar coach i think she just had a stellar team um <clears throat> and so she'll be linked with it but i think that would show like a real lack of imagination so i'm i'm glad they're kind of they're tendering it i do wonder if they will um that they will have to consult um to to some extent and claire wheatley the head of women's football at the club uh, former player she's been in that position for a long time mm. she will be consulted as well but the other point of interest here is you you referenced uh, the the ongoing structural review that that was started last summer um, early last summer, they've been going into this. I do also think Joe kind of hinted in his press conference yesterday. He said, you know, we're, we're looking at um, how the role might change. Um, and and I think uh, that, yeah, the role of coach might change. And I think, again, he's kind of thinking maybe this is, you know, just another piece of evidence that suggests this is a good time to hand over. What, what My, do you, uh, so what after do you we mean that by that? Podcast, Sorry. I mean, what did the role of... Um, head coach changing. So 
he didn't he didn't elaborate but mm. what i suspect after after we did that podcast last time i i made some lines of inquiry ab- about this review and and i'm reading between the lines here this isn't privileged information this is my guess i think they might make another appointment um almost like a technical director um for the for the women's team right. um, that, that's just my guess but that's kind of me reading between the lines and so that that might come into play in terms of what's expected of the coach if they're expected to work a bit more closely with someone like that, perhaps on transfer targets, contracts, et cetera, et cetera, because it's all becoming a bigger enterprise. Mm. With the TV deal, there's more money coming into it and obviously mo money, mo, mo problems. There's yeah. bigger, <laughs> there's more stuff expected. And, For sure. and the staff, the technical staff has grown a lot under Joe. That's another big part of his legacy. So um, I, I think, things were kind of set to change a little bit anyway from next season and maybe well I, i'm kind of certain actually that joe's kind of looked at that and thought well actually maybe that's that's just another sign that this is a good time to to hand over and if you read the job advert it does suggest quite strongly that it will be the coach's role will be a bit more about working with someone um and i, I tend to think that signals maybe a technical director. Um, Claire Wheatley's there as the head of women's football. She is, um, to my knowledge, more of a kind of an administrator um, and that maybe they're, they're looking for someone to bring in to really kind of work on structure transfers, all the things that, that probably Edu does on the men's yeah. side. And just very finally, you mentioned it there. There is a new TV deal, which means greater exposure for for the women's game and, and more chance for Arsenal fans to watch Arsenal women. Just a brief um, summary of what's happening and, and when that will be available. Yeah, sure. So that starts next season. It's a deal worth uh, £21 million over three seasons, so £7 million each. Um, Some of that money will go to the clubs. 25% of it will go to clubs in the championship, so in the second tier. Some of the money will be held over for things... um, about the development of the game. So, for example, pitch improvements, there are still too many postponements in the WSL, refereeing standards, the Mm. refs are still semi-pro. So there'll be a lot of that going on. But yeah, so from next season in the UK, Sky Sports will be showing uh, the WSL alongside BBC. So it will retain a lot of its kind of free-to-air exposure, which is really great. It's kind of the best of both worlds. It's the first time anyone's paid money to show women's football in the UK. BT and BBC um, had, had had the deal that's that's currently going that expires at the end of this season. They don't actually pay for it at the moment. They literally just pay the costs of broadcasting the game. So it's, right. it's really the first time we're getting someone putting money down. And were it not for the pandemic, it probably would have been more than 21 million as well. Mm. The other thing Sky are promising, which I think is really important, is their I mean, we all know, um, well, those of us in the UK anyway, know what Sky Sports are like with the kind of the hype and the build up and things like that. They're promising to do all of that. So studio guests, analysis of the games, uh, both before and after, uh, which which I think is great and much needed exposure for the women's game. I still don't think we talk about the football enough and I'm really hoping that Sky do that. So it's it's um, it's just it's another marker. Um, really it's it's a real watershed moment and it also means that more games will have their own tv slot um over weekends so that what they've done is they've carved out a time on friday nights for example also an 11 30 a.m kickoff on a sunday a sunday evening kickoff um because obviously they're trying to avoid where they can yeah. clashing with premier league games so it's it's a massive game changer it means more money coming in and um it's uh, it's it's really um certainly for europe it's it's an absolute leader um, and it's yeah, it's 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 an enormous positive development for the women's game. All right. Well, look, still plenty to play for for the Arsenal women in what remains of this season, and fingers crossed they can achieve that Champions League place. Uh, it's not impossible, of course, for the Arsenal men to achieve a Champions League place either. Um, you know, when you look at what lies ahead in the Europa League, it's not that it's easy, but it's certainly not impossible. Um, mm-hmm. We do have a, a game against Liverpool this weekend. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to preview that on, on Patreon uh, with Lewis tomorrow. So uh, beyond the sort of superficial 
uh, news about injuries to Bakayo Saka and Emile Smith-Rowe. There isn't really any team news yet. Players still coming back from international duty in dribs and drabs, and they're all going to be assessed. So it's not going to be until tomorrow or Saturday, even when Mikel Arteta really has a good idea of, of who he can pick in that game. So it's difficult to preview that beyond the, you know, the, the sense that it's just a big game, Arsenal mm-hmm. versus Liverpool at home. And uh, what's interesting, I suppose, is that both teams have got European football uh, to look forward to and perhaps particularly from a Liverpool point of view to prioritise given they've got Real Madrid on Tuesday. Tuesday yeah so I mean that that's that's certainly going to be much more in the the eyeline of Jurgen Klopp than Slavia Prague is going to be for Mikel Arteta which is not taking place until next Thursday but you know how do you view um, what's left of this season from an Arsenal perspective because Arteta spoke about how he views the remainder of the of the season and basically rolled out the every game is a final line, which mm-hmm. is reasonable. I you know I I can see exactly where he's coming from with that, but some games might become more finally than others if you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah. As we go on, you know it, it would be great to get a good result against Liverpool on Saturday, but even despite their troubles this season, it's going to be tough because they're a really good team. Um, And it might make uh, uh, finishing in a position in the Premier League, a European position in the Premier League, even more difficult than it is already. I, I, I think it's... I think it's a bit of a long shot. It's not impossible, but I do think it's a long shot. So there comes a point where you say, right, this game is a final, but that game there is a much bigger final than this particular final we're going to we're going to play you know at what point do we start putting more of our eggs in the Europa League basket if you like so I think I, I wouldn't do that until six um, looks really out of play. I, I don't think Arsenal can afford both in the literal, um, both in the literal sense financially um, and in the, in the, I guess the more narrative sense to, to not play in Europe next year. Mm. So I, I don't think they can afford to put all of their eggs in the Europa League basket until, um, until six is really out of play. I also think um, that, like the, the the benefit of momentum, particularly with the way Arsenal mm. have been playing the last couple of months, I think they've built up some momentum, and therefore, I really think it would be detrimental to to kind of um, to to take that away and start saying, well, actually, we're not really going to try for this game. Oh, yeah. Not that we're not going to try, yeah, but we're going to rotate heavily. Yeah. I, I do also think Arsenal's squad is big enough that they can rotate. Um, two to three players every game no problem like I don't think it's um, I don't think we should be in a perhaps in a scenario where we were at the end of the Wenger reign where it was very much we had a a Europa League 11 Mm. and a Premier League 11 like I do think you know you can you can take Saka out and put Pepe in that that's fine nobody would call that a massive weakening um, of your team you can take Aubameyang out and put Lacazette in and nobody's going to accuse you of like throwing the game if you're doing that so I I think um, Arteta has the tools to gently rotate the team for me even if and when the kind of the Premier League is is kind of out of the question I just I just don't ever have the sense that it works when you do that when you split your season up like that I really think you only do that once you're in the realms of if I don't know Aubameyang's hamstring goes bang he misses the final kind of thing I I think that's when you start to make that kind of decision or if he gets a booking here he might miss the final you know when it when it's like it, it could be season ending or they miss like the one big game, the cup final or something like that. Mm. That to me should be the only real time you prioritize. Um, I also, I, I think as well, there, there have been some developments in the thinking in terms of periodization and, and that actually a lot of, um, a lot of kind of fitness staff now are kind of saying that actually resting players regularly is not good for them, that it's actually better for them to keep ticking over, particularly at this point of the season where they don't need as much training at this point of the season. So it's much more viable to give players like, I I don't think they'll do it now because of the international break, but let's say Liverpool or let's say after Sheffield United, you could probably you know, give the players a day or two off after that because at this point of the season, they're so highly tuned, they, they don't necessarily need to train every single day. So I, I think there are things that we can do. But for me, I, I am not at all in the kind of 
um I, I, I just don't think we're close yet yeah to the um to the the prioritization i don't think that really happens until the semi-final so if we get past slavia prague and we're in the semis we can have a look at where we are then um but even then i probably wouldn't look at completely resting players i might look at making creative substitutions or perhaps mm -hmm giving players 20 minutes instead of 90. But I, I just think things break down a little bit when you make that decision too early. Yeah, exactly. When you draw the lines in the sand, it's sort of like, OK, well, look, if we fuck up the Premier League, at least you've still got the Europa League. But if you fuck up the Europa League, you're completely yep. fucked. You know what I mean? But I think it is going to be interesting to see how he manages the squad. You know, I think we're in some ways quite lucky in that, and you know, again, this is not taking anything for granted. And we've watched Arsenal play against teams we should supposedly beat countless times this season, and and we haven't done it. You know, so it's mm. not to say that there are easy games, but you know, in this run in, um, there are. We've got Sheffield United, we've got Fulham, we've got Newcastle, we've got West Brom, we've got Crystal Palace, we've got Brighton, which is again not to take anything for granted, but you know. Those are games where I, I think if a manager is inclined to use the depth of his squad, he can do so, you know, perhaps not in the way that Unai Emery did for that Crystal Palace game, <laughs> but you know what I mean? And like, if yeah. you need to give Kieran Tierney a rest, given how yep. much he's played, you know, you can play Cedric at left back in some of those fixtures and not worry too much. It doesn't mean you don't need to get a, a left back for next season or anything like mm -hmm. that. And, and, you know, I know exactly what you're saying about momentum and I, I worry, I, I wonder sometimes if we as fans worry far more about things like fatigue than yeah. players do and managers do. You know, wow. I, I think we get super focused on these things and we, we, we go at it from the worst case scenario point of view. Yep. Because we're afraid, and we've seen it happen, of course, but I think we're afraid, and I don't know that players and managers really see the same kind of issues around this sort of stuff as we do. Like, look at Bakayo Saka, for example. We're all terribly worried about Saka, but he plays because he wants yeah. to play. He says he's fit to play. He passes the fitness test. Arteta, what, you know, common sense does come into it to, to a certain extent, but, you know, if there are 14 games between the 3rd of April and the whatever it is, the end of May. I don't know what the date of the Europa League final is. Day of my birthday, 26th of May. 26th of May. So that's only yeah. three days after the end of the season. Yeah. Um, and happy birthday in advance. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and if that's not a good omen about what's going to happen, I don't know what is. But, you know, it's still quite a lot of football to play in a short period of time, given the, the pressure and everything else. So it is going to be interesting to see what Arteta does to, to like you say, change little bits without being radical in terms of, you know, okay, I'm going to rest every good player we have and, you know, play the reserves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, and that's um, that's the art of squad management. And, and, and I guess, to be fair, not a position that Arteta has been in um, an awful lot because the end of last season was, was very different because they yeah. had just had a couple of months off. Uh, when that all came around. So, um, but yeah, like when you look through this Arsenal team um, and I'll let listeners decide whether they think this is a strength or not, there aren't that many players you look at and think, oh God, we like we can't, we can't replace him. Uh, you're probably looking at Tierney. Mm. Um, the, the central midfield, yeah, well, I think we all know ideally we'd want Xhaka and party fit. Like if we're in, say, a semi-final second leg of Europa League, then those are, t those are three players really you'd look at and say yeah we need to protect those players like even a um i i you know he with with because lacazette has played well as a center forward he's a very different type of center forward he has played well enough i i would still i still think it'd be a massive blow to lose a bamiang but if we did there is someone there who can take the place to a reasonable standard yeah it's not a no bamiang to inkedia jump if exactly you know what i mean yeah Exactly. So it, it's really, it's it's how, I guess it's how um, he protects someone like Tierney, maybe someone like Xhaka um, as well, whether you think he's one of our best players, he's certainly one of our most important. Um, and Partey obviously has 
uh, issues we're trying to manage anyway. So, and and Saka, I mean, so with Saka, for example, I think he's dropped off since he was rested. Um, to be <laughs> honest, now whether whether that's causation and correlation, I don't know. I think was it Leicester? He was rested, and I think he's been a bit off mm. ever since. Now, to be fair, I think that was probably in the post anyway. Um, but but some sometimes that can happen, and there are players like that as well. I think Alexis was this type of player who, if you rest him, that's when you start to get, start lose, to get problems. Lose the rhythm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, he, you know, he has to know his players. He has to know, um, you know, he has to know exactly what kind of situation they're in, what condition they're in. And to be fair, he has made mistakes about that this mm. season. Um, you know, playing Tierney for 120 minutes in an FA Cup tie, playing party in the North London derby. I guess we've just got to hope he's learned from those mistakes. Yeah. I do think he has, like the way he's used party, um, for example, does suggest to me that he's uh, and and you know he has he did take Saka out for that Leicester game, so it does suggest to me that you know his his mind's on it. But to your point, you know when did Arsenal rest Thierry Henry? When did Barcelona rest Lionel Messi? You know they don't like the big players play. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. And and the vast majority of them managed to do it without their limbs falling off. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I mean, the only one that, that, that comes to mind when you talk about players being replaceable is Martin Odegaard and just in terms of, yeah. you know, how, how vital he has been, particularly in recent weeks. But, you know, let's, uh, let's not go there. We'll uh, cross whatever bridges we need to cross as and when we come to them. But look, we better leave it there. Tim, thanks a million as, as always and uh, good to talk to you. My pleasure as always. Thank you very much to Tim. You know where to find him. He's on Twitter at Stilberto. He writes a column every week uh, for us here on arsblog.com and over on Arsblog News, there is the most comprehensive resource uh, and website that you can find about the Arsenal women. Lots of news, interviews, profiles, podcasts, and even starter step-by-step guides about women's football and the Arsenal women if you're going into it a bit blind. So if you're looking to get more involved ahead of next season, if you want to just uh, increase your knowledge and understanding, you can find it all there over on Arsblog News, which is at Arsblog News on Twitter, or just go to arsblog.news in your browser and you'll find it there. Or in the Arsblog apps, you know we have apps, right? There's an app for iOS and an app for Android, which you can find in the in the various app stores. So if you haven't already downloaded that, why not give that a try? Okay, joining me now on the Arsecast to look ahead to this weekend's game against Liverpool at the Emirates on Saturday evening. Delighted to welcome back from the Anfield Wrap, it's Neil Atkinson. Hi, Neil. Hello there. Always a pleasure to be on. Thanks a million. Listen, the last time we spoke, I think you were, you, Liverpool, were either just about to win the title or uh, you had just won the title. Uh, It had become impossible for anyone else to win it. And we spoke at the time about how weird it was because this was just after uh, lockdown and uh, football's restart and, and everything was so strange and surreal. And it is still strange and surreal, but maybe we've got a bit more used to it now. And you were talking a bit about how you know, not being able to be there to celebrate winning the title and then to sort of go through a season where you're at every game and you're the champions and you're singing the songs about being the champions. How has that been, you know, given that the the season probably hasn't panned out as, as well as you might have liked? And we'll come to that in a moment. But like, how how odd is, has this season been to you? It's been thoroughly miserable um, in the end, to be Mm. quite honest. There was a period where you thought, well, you'll get to celebrate it four or five times. And then every time you go back in the ground with them as champions, Mm. you'll get to celebrate it, whether they win or lose. And let's be clear about this. But I think it's I think it's genuinely like it's it's a lot of people because we've reduced too much of our football chatter to the idea of, of banter would like to find this something that they could point and laugh at. But I just think it's desperately sad. And I think it was desperately sad if it was another club, to be quite honest with you. This isn't me sort of saying, feel sorry for Liverpool. Mm. Because the fact of the matter is Liverpool won the league. They won 26 out of 27 games. They got 99 points. They battered the league into submission. um, And they deservedly won the league title. Liverpool have won a title in my lifetime. I have celebrated it to an extent. So there's no, you know, that cannot be taken away. But what's been lost is those footballers have literally never gone on to a 
got got onto the Anfield turf, having worked in some cases for ten years for the club and mm. other cases for three years for the club, and being acclaimed as champions. They've literally not had that moment. They've not got on an open top bus parade where the city of Liverpool will be absolutely rammed. We haven't got to share that with one another and with them. And, you know, in terms of losing out on that shared experience, as I say, we've all had the experience and the trophy is won and it's all done and that's mm. all fine. But the shared experience is completely gone. And that is thoroughly miserable, Andrew. You know, there's yeah. no for me, there's no there's no other, there's no flip side to that, there's no funny side to that. It's just deeply sad that that moment has not been had by by a collective of people. Yeah, look, I, I look, I think as Arsenal fans we can identify with that because we won the FA Cup during lockdown and nobody yeah. was uh, nobody was there to to celebrate and you know, it, it's not like it was our first FA Cup in recent times. So we've we've been there, done that and worn the t-shirt, but it's a fucking great t-shirt to wear, you know, exactly. to 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 celebrate with um you know, your friends and random strangers and all of those things, you know, when you win a trophy you know, part of it obviously is just the winning of it, but a big, big part of it is the celebration and the sharing of it and the sharing of the experience. You know, I can tell you that when we won the FA Cup in 2014, having not won a trophy for, for nine years and it being so long overdue, that night is a night that many, many Arsenal fans remember hugely fondly. It's not that winning an FA Cup 3-2 against Hull City is the pinnacle of football or anything like it, but just from a, a sheer experience point of view, you yeah. wouldn't change it for anything. No, you wouldn't. And, you know, this was the first title Liverpool have won in 30 years. Yeah. Um, and as I say, those players, they, they, you know, they, they, they put a 98-point season and follow it up with a 99-point season. They couldn't have given any more. Um, and we had those experiences along the way. You know, I said all the way through, well, I was at Leicester away and that felt like a massive win. And Arsenal supporters will know that you don't win the title in a one-off game. Mm. You win the title over a long period of time. So we shared those moments. But the idea of this season being able to sing, bring on the champions, being able to acclaim them as such, you know, being able to go to hypothetically Old Trafford with them as champions. You know, all of those sorts of things mm. w- w- have been, have just been lost to yeah. be honest with you. And as I say, it's, it's, it's not a sporting thing. It's just this huge shame. And I think it has had a bit of an impact. I think one of the things that Klopp looked to do very early on, he was mocked, you know, in 20, uh, in 2015, when he took the players to the cop after we drew 2-2 with a late deflected equaliser against West Bromwich Albion. And he took the players to the cop because there'd been issues with a lot of people leaving the ground early. And he very much, it was the idea that there was a bit of a covenant being built. You know, you, you, They'll give you everything if you give them everything and vice versa. Mm. And a lot of that, I think, is... I don't think... you know. Let me be clear about this. I don't think Liverpool's issues this season can just be reduced to one sentence anywhere, but I certainly don't think they can be reduced to, you know, oh, well, there's no fans. Yeah. But I do think that if you built a collective and cultural identity in part upon the idea of these people, which I think Klopp, it's fair to argue, has done, and then you take these people away at your moment of greatest triumph... Well, that will have a knock-on effect, and that will certainly when things aren't going quite as well as you'd like, certainly when there is a bit of adversity. For me, it's really sad. We get beat 1-0 by Burnley, and we were 60, I think we've 65 games unbeaten at home. It's a club record. Yeah. 65 league games unbeaten at home, club record. So Liverpool in the past have won titles in three consecutive seasons, but they've never gone that many games unbeaten at home. And I was so that was the game I was saddest not to be in the ground for, just to clap them off. Just to say, well, in lads, yeah. you know, I've never, no other Liverpool team's ever done that. So not to like roll them home so that they don't get beat one 0 by Burnley, because that ironically is the perfect way to lose a home record of sixty five games. Is a contentious penalty defeat one 0 at home to Burnley. That's perfect. That's the way it should go. It shouldn't go to Arsenal or to Manchester United or to Everton. Yeah, it yeah. should go to Burnley, <laughs> and it should be that sort of game. But then what happens is we all stay in the ground, and they almost get to do a, a quasi lap of honour that they don't feel like doing. But by the end of that lap of honour, they feel like yeah. Oh, right this is great we're all in this together and everything feels good yeah and they haven't got that either and all of these things are just the shame of it they do, really are do you worry that it might in some way impact the relationship between fans and players i'm talking on a broad level here um you know Mikel arteta has said more than once this season he can't wait to have fans back in the stadium and now obviously we can all understand that and there are also uh, people who will say well you're you're kind of lucky at times uh, that there weren't fans in the stadium, given how poor things were going for Arsenal at, at certain periods. But 
you know, I'm thinking of, you know, some young players who've broken through, Bakayo Saka, Emile Smith-Rowe, who have broken through, not entirely, but in, in, in large part during a period where there are no fans, where there's no either no pressure or no appreciation for what it is that you're trying to do. We have Martin Odegaard on loan from Real Madrid, yeah. which is good for you considering what's coming up, <laughs> given how good uh, he is. You'd be glad he's with us rather than... Um, uh, Real Madrid in the Champions League, although, uh, fingers crossed, he might do something on Saturday. But again, you know, here's this guy who's come in on loan. He's played absolutely brilliantly. And there's really no way... Look, you can show appreciation and you can uh, uh, players can get feedback in different ways these days, but there is nothing quite like, no. you know, playing brilliantly in a game and the manager goes, right, you're coming off on 85 minutes. I'm going to put a guy on. The game is won. You've, you've been the guy. I'm yeah. going to take you off and you get that round of applause. I mean, do, do you worry that players might be impacted by that in a negative way? Or do you think this is something that they'll be able to compartmentalize and say, okay, look, it was a weird period, a, a strange time in everybody's lives, and, and we can move on and, and deal with it? Or might there be some some sort of ripple effects from this that we're not quite sure of just yet? I think they're, they're not quite sure of just yet. It's massive. I think that first and foremost, obviously, because football is a hugely disparate people, I think it will affect them all differently. I think, though, collectively, there will be a short term when the grounds, so let's hope like next season grounds are full from day one. Yeah. So I think that there'll be a short term boost, I think, you know, with grounds being full. I think everyone will feel great about it. But then there will come, you know, certain moments, certainly if certain players are finding it hard, which happens to all footballers at some point in their career and most players at some point over the course of the season. You know, we keep thinking about the roar of the first tackle, but the collective sigh at the first misplaced pass is also <laughs> going to have an impact. Let's be honest. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think that, you know, and listen, I think that for the first sort of six games or so, I think it will just be an absolute ball of incredible energy. But then I think it will be a little bit different. I think on the whole, it will just simply be better. But it wouldn't surprise me if there are a few players who, for the first time in a while, do remember that sort of collective sigh, do have that shock of seeing disappointed faces when they miss the one-on-one -on -one and suddenly are sort of plunged into something. I think it will, you know, I think all of this will have impacted them anyway so far. Even just as simple as we forget that, you know, Liverpool and Arsenal are clubs who've got a long history now of 20 years or so of import players from overseas you know we've ripped these lads away from the families for extended periods of time the friends and families back home um and given them no bridge back to be able to see them i think all of that will have an impact we've yeah. told them they can't leave the houses i felt particularly sorry for minamino who we signed in the january last season who basically moves to a completely new country uh is already you know from a japanese point of view pulled from one culture into a different one in european life when he was in austria then moves from austria to england has no real chance to make any degree of friends whether that's within the squad or not and then is pu plunged into this lockdown environment yeah. that he's, he's barely able to get out of so I think on the whole I think with with many of these lads I think we it wouldn't surprise me if as and when the autobiographies are written in 10-15 years time they do all talk about this even the ones who looked as though they were successful as though this was a really difficult period mm. and there's one or two who say you know what it was the making of me you know Kalechi and Acho at the minute at Leicester is a really good example of a player who's just all of a sudden blossomed and it may well be that that blossoming might have become increasingly difficult after poor performance and poor performance at the King Power but as it is he's just blossomed recently and if he rides that wave then he might be saying at the end of the season you know what it was useful for me that that yeah. wasn't the case so I think there'll be one or two who were like that but it wouldn't surprise me if even some of the players who look like they've been great end up saying towards the end it was amongst the toughest periods of my career I would say so because you know there are countless examples of players who who can use football and performances and being on the pitch as a way of distracting themselves from difficult yeah. periods in their lives off the pitch whether it's personal or professional or whatever it might be you know when they go onto the pitch they can just focus on you know being a footballer and enjoying their football it doesn't mean that everything is hunky-dory behind the scenes well look you know it'll all come out in the wash I, I do want to talk to you a little bit about um your season so far um it looked like it was going pretty well and then there was a bit of a blip and then there was this period where you lost six uh, in seven which I think is uh, a reminder that even the best teams can go through periods which are well below the standards that, that they've set but I, I know you said there are many reasons for it but how how much of this do you think is down to 
those two seasons where, by any standards, what Liverpool did was extraordinary in terms of games won and points gained. And to lose the title by a single point to Manchester City, despite racking up the number of wins and points that you did, and then going again and doing something almost, uh, did, I can't remember if it was more points or less points, but one more, uh, point. One more point. point. I mean, incredible. It, that kind of consistency and that kind of focus is is remarkable. And it's hard to think of an, uh, an example of a team which has, you know, done that and not been absolutely um, disheartened by what they've done. What Liverpool did was kept it up. It must have been a monumental effort, physically, mentally, you know, in terms of concentration and application and uh, and the work they must have had to put in. Is this season now something of a a consequence of of that, do you think? I think I think that the I'd love to see the parallels, uh, the parallel universe season where where Van Dyke and Gomez don't get injured. I think yeah. everyone remembers the Van Dyke thing, but Gomez become well Go- Gomez is almost by the time the Gomez injury happens it's actually more of a blow because then it, he you know he is the second one if they were the other way around then obviously Van Dyke would be more of a blow mm. but Gomez becomes more of a blow I think because he basically becomes Liverpool's uh, the idea that Liverpool can look to play at the very least similar football with reference to where the line is as effectively and all of that is, you know, you can you, you can do it without one of Van Dijk and Gomez. And Gomez, had, by the way, had six really good games after Van Dijk first got injured. Mm. To do it with both, without both is, is a bit of an unknown. I think there would have been over the course of the campaign, even saying, even with no COVID, um, I think there would have been a natural little bit of a diminishing. That said, I think that's part of the reason why Klopp had brought in Alcantara. It's part of the reason why he brought in Jota was because I think he was looking to sort of address that a tiny little bit. Um, so I think he's. I think that was, you know, Liverpool don't buy any first team players in the summer of 2019. They just trust those lads to go again and those lads do go again and win 26 out of the first 27. So I think all in, there is... You know, I think he was. Liverpool are aware that they were they were going to have to evolve a little bit, tweak a little bit, and as I say, I think that those signings do suggest that. But ultimately, it's almost become a bit of a can't. Now, we were in a false false position running up to Christmas, to be honest with you, right. where because we were just we were just keeping the wolf from the door around the injuries. It was it, everything was just one result. What what was one more injury away? And when it finally broke, I think Matip gets injured. We're one 0 up uh, just after Christmas against uh, West Brom at Anfield, and Matip gets injured. And we, we've we've ultimately never entirely recovered from that one. We were just we were not quite ourselves. We were not quite sure where our defensive line was. We were getting okay results. Um, but we weren't going at, you know, it wasn't like we were going at the, the rate City have been going at for the last God knows how many games. You know, we were going we were going at just over two points a game, but we were, weren't going that much over. We were top because nobody else should be. Mm. You know, we, we, beat, we beat Tottenham at Anfield 2-1 to go top um, and go above them. And we were the better side than them because they're an absolute, you know, they're a mess. But we were only, you know, that was 28 points from 13 games. It wasn't like it, you know. It, it wasn't thirty-one points from thirteen games. It wasn't. It wasn't like it has been for Liverpool and Manchester City across the last few seasons, or even Conte's Chelsea. There wasn't something. So you know, the goal difference at that point when we beat Tottenham, it was only ten. Our goal difference was mm. only plus ten. So it was just all a bit of a false position, and it could have just remained that. You know, everyone was saying at that time it's going to be the most spectacular title race. Any one of eight teams can win it, and then Manchester City just sort of went, no, only one of one team can win yeah. it. Um, so I think that's worth remembering in amongst all of this that you know it, things weren't quite right there. But what happens is that the, the the impact of those, especially those injuries to the heart of the defence, they just keep mounting up. Then there's no Gomez, there's no Van Dijk, then there's no Matip for extended periods. And then Matip ends up being out for the whole season after the West Brom injury. And then there's no Fabinho for an extended period mm. of time. And you're just down to really willing young footballers or inexperienced footballers. But you can only hang on to that for so long and you can only paper over those cracks. And then what began to go wrong, which is the bit that hasn't got much discussion because everyone focuses on the injuries, is I think that all three of the front three at different moments have had crises of confidence or Mm. form because they felt as though the entire burden was on them. And it's really interesting to see how they look like. It's like when they play in Europe, it's like taking off tight shoes. They just relax <laughs> completely playing in Europe, playing domestically. Still, even now, they're pulling at things, they're rushing things, they're getting really irate with, with, with the officials, they're finding the way they refereed really hard. A lot of what Liverpool did ever so well for two, the two seasons where they had those points totals 
uh, Andrew was they just stayed in the moment in matches. They were very reminiscent of Arsenal's Invincibles in terms of yeah. just playing the game that's in front of them, playing the next 10 minutes that's in front of them. And Liverpool have started, a number of Liverpool players, you know, across the last sort of three months, have started to be arguing about the referee and decision from five minutes ago. I've started to do the thing this mm. time round that they should have done last time round, but this time round it's not the right thing to do. Yeah. They've lost that sort of vibe of being in the moment because results obviously impact confidence and that spread. Whereas when they played in the European game, home and away against Schalke, they just look like we know exactly how to do this. This is all fine. We understand everything. We're not still annoyed about a refereeing decision from three weeks ago from the same fella. Yeah. All of that sort of stuff. So I, I think that has, I think Liverpool, Liverpool have shown an unbelievable amount of mental strength for a long time. But I do think that they've not been that great in amongst adversity. A really good example I've been talking for a while, so I'll stop in a minute. Away at Leicester, the, we can't win the league. We, we're the better side than Leicester. We go 1-0 up. They get a really contentious VAR goal that takes forever to sort out. And Liverpool kick off like men possessed. But the truth of the matter is, we're trying to just come top four. We didn't need to win. A point would have been fine. Mm. And if we just play our way back in in that moment, we'd have been absolutely fine. And then what happens is everyone goes berserk. And then the goalkeeper runs into the centre half and then Leicester make it 2-1 and then everyone even goes even more berserk. Yeah. Liverpool last season would have just took five minutes to take stock. They'd have passed the ball around, they'd have took the sting out of Leicester and then they'd have said, right, we're going to make your lives a living hell. If you get out of this 1-1, five minutes to go, then all the best to you, well done. We're going to make your lives a living hell and we're just playing this game in your half and in your final third. That's what they would have done last season. This season, they all panicked, they all ran around, they had an unbelievable sense of urgency and they got beat 3-1. Right. So, I mean, based on what you say about domestic form versus European form and, and the situation that Liverpool find themselves in at the moment, five points off the top four, you know, so it's not anywhere close to being impossible to finish in the top four, but with a big, big Champions League game, really um, obviously great Champions League pedigree uh, in recent years as well. How do you think Jurgen Klopp is going to approach this game at the weekend? Every manager says, look, the next game is the most important game. Focus is, is, uh, is on Arsenal. And Mikel Arteta said today, focus is on our Europa League game or is on Liverpool, not the Europa League game that we have next week. But... You know, there are circumstances and things that they kind of have to weigh up when they make the decisions uh, when it comes to team selection and, and, and not how seriously they take a game, but how much they might prioritize one game over another. So do you feel like there's any way that Jurgen Klopp, you know, given that your game is on Tuesday, we have the, the benefit of a couple of extra days before we play in Europe. Do you feel like what he does this weekend will be informed by what's coming up uh, in the Champions League against Real Madrid. Yes, frankly. I think, ultimately, I think Liverpool could uh, finish top four, um, but to do it, they need to win of the remaining nine, win eight and draw one. And at no point this season, even when we were top mm. of the league, have we looked like we're winning eight and drawing one. So, sorry, winning seven and drawing. No, it's winning eight. We've still got, we've yeah. still got nine games left. Win eight, draw one. Um, and I think that... You know, things like, so Alexander-Arnold doesn't go off on England duty, so that's a bit of a result. The Brazilians don't go away, so that's a bit of a result. Um, but Robertson's played three, so it wouldn't surprise me if Robertson uh, doesn't start the game against Arsenal, um, even though it does feel as though he starts every match, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if they have a look at that one. I think Wijnaldum's had all three for Holland, so it wouldn't surprise me if Wijnaldum is very much given over to the European campaign. You know, it wouldn't surprise mm. me if he doesn't play either of the next two league games, to be honest. There's, there'll be a decision to be made up front. And then what all that does, what that gives you the, 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 the ability to do is then also be able to rest other people through subs. So it might be that you decide you want to give Wijnaldum 30 minutes so he does the last 30 and he comes on for, for Alcantara or something like that. So yeah. I, th I think ultimately, yes. And I think it's also the right thing to do. Um, I think Liverpool are most likely routes back into the Champions League next season is probably to win it just. But also... I do feel a little bit like this is a team that needs to try to win the Champions League, if you see what I mean. Like, this isn't a side that's not won a Champions League or a league in the last few years. Mm. It's a side that's now full of winners. And I think that whilst, listen, don't get me wrong, if you offer me a guaranteed fourth place now and a defeat in a Champions League semi-final, I'll take it because I think it's important for the club. But I don't think I don't think Mo Salah would, and I don't think Sadio Mane would. They'd say, we, we want to lift the shiny thing, Neil. 
Yeah. Let, us, let us try and lift the shiny thing because that's what we're here to do. This, this is our career. You're just thinking about the, the long-term run of the club <laughs> and being back next season. We're thinking about literally, you know, we how many Champions League quarterfinals will we get to play in over the course of our career? Yeah. We're in one now. I mean, is so, there, sorry to cut across you, I mean, is yeah. there an element of, you know, because of the, the age profiles of some of the players in the yeah, squad, absolutely. is that that's a factor as well, isn't it? Really, like Mane is coming up on 29, Salah's coming up on 29, it's not to say they're over the hill or anything like it, but but it's at that age where they start thinking about, right, where am I going to play the final years of my career, et cetera, et cetera. And, and clubs have to think about, well, you know, are we going to commit to these guys into their early to mid 30s or are we going to rebuild? Yeah, I, a really good way to phrase this is if Mo Salah's career goes perfectly from this point, and I mean perfectly, he only plays five more Champions League semifinals. Mm. Um, quarterfinals even you know in the first five more Champions League quarterfinals let alone semifinals which he's got the opportunity to do and I think that's a really interesting way to look at it and it's an important way to look at it you know Thiago Alcantara is 30 years old he is currently a European champion with Bayern Munich He's come to Liverpool because he wants to win more trophies and finish his career playing uh, playing intense football that involves the winning of trophies. So for these lads, I think it's an easy sell um, in terms of rest and rotation. I think it is, you know, this idea of there is this thing on the horizon. You can win that or we're trying to guide our way through into fourth. And listen, don't get me wrong, they'll all want to come forth as well. They'll want to win every game. They're in t- intensely driven professionals. But Liverpool's biggest game of the next of the next two is Real Madrid. It just is Real Madrid. Yeah. That's the way in which it works. And so if the manager makes his, makes his decisions accordingly, I'm not going to, you know, snort in derision or anything like that. That said, last season, the season before, Liverpool in the running, they needed to win every game. Well, the season before, especially 18-19, going head-to-head with City, we needed to win every game and we won the Champions League. I would feel comfortable with that if I had Gomez and Van Dijk had set it yeah. off. And that's where all of this becomes a little bit difficult. And when I said before, you know, the idea of go and play day draw one from now until the end of the campaign. Again, if I've got Gomez and Van Dijk at centre half, I'm doing this this show with you, and your listeners are thinking, "My God, he talks a lot, and he's very, very bullish." Whereas right now they're thinking, "My God, he talks a lot," and that's the difference. <laughs> and I think that that's your, you know, that is the sort for me. Yeah, that's not where we are. We've got to sort of say, "What is it that we want? What is it that we prioritize?" And listen, we could make four or five changes from what would be the side that starts against Real Madrid mm. we could still get a result against Arsenal yeah, you know, Arsenal sure. just drew 3-3 with West Ham we could still get a result and we can make op- we can make changes from the bench to make that more likely as the game wears on so on and so forth but it's all a knife edge but the point is is that our knife edge is nowhere near as sharp as it has been in the past yeah sure look I, it's, it's one of those fixtures which I think maybe a year ago I would be a lot less confident about and obviously you know Liverpool's season uh, instills a little bit of confidence in, in an opposition and Absolutely. you know from an Arsenal perspective we've been quite good since December since we beat Chelsea before that it's like you know you just want to wipe it off the face of the earth what we did and how we did it and the way we played and everything else and there have been some interesting games between between the two sides uh, even this season you know you think about the, the Community Shield which of course just a glorified friendly but when you looked at that game and how how it was, how competitive it was. I thought that was really interesting, you know. Um, Jurgen Klopp doesn't tend to get annoyed by stuff which doesn't matter. And he was a little bit annoyed, you know, that day, um, not necessarily by the result, but, you know, I think it's good to be able to provide competition to a team which were champions and the best team in England. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, on Saturday evening. I wish you the best of luck in Europe. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if not for the weekend. And look, Neil, thank you again for your time. Really enjoyed talking to you. Take care. Thanks so much to Neil. You can find him on Twitter at Knox underscore Harrington at Knox underscore Harrington. And of course, he is part of the amazing Enfield Rap crew, which do such amazing work for Liverpool pool fans and beyond that is the enfield right as i said a bit earlier on with tim uh, on a thursday when players are still coming back from injury or from injury from the interlull i should say there isn't much in the way of team news so it's difficult to preview the game against liverpool so we will be doing that on patreon myself and lewis ambrose will preview the liverpool game in a bit more detail uh, over on patreon patreon.com forward slash blog if you're not already a member there you can sign up and support uh, everything that we do as well as getting bonus content extra podcasts discord chat 
add ad free podcasts. Uh, there's a free audio book and all kinds of stuff over there as well. Patreon.com forward slash Arse Blog. Before we go today, just want to shout back a little bit to the Arse Cast Extra on Monday, in which James and I, I think we discussed international moments by Arsenal players, the ones that stick in the mind. And we talked about Vieira and Petit at the World Cup in 98. We talked about the Dennis Bergkamp count goal at the World Cup as well against Argentina and my apologies to every uh, fellow Irishman listening to this for completely forgetting about David O'Leary's penalty against Romania in the World Cup in 1990 which really should have been uh, quite near the top of my list. That was uh, an incredible moment particularly as I don't think I'd ever seen David O'Leary take a penalty before and given his relationship with Jack Charlton which was in grade when he stepped up to take the decisive penalty for Ireland I was like oh please please David O'Leary score this penalty which he did of course and it was an amazing moment but just harking back to that Dennis Bergkamp commentary which I'm sure you're all uh, very familiar with I had an email from a listener called Stuart Ballingall I think it's Ballingall anyway if he was Irish it would definitely be Ballingall but uh, never mind I think it's Stuart Ballingall and he sent me in this little remix that he did of it which I thought was excellent and uh, I want to play it for you guys now so uh, here's your new ringtone folks Nederland gaat in de halve finale komen. Ik heb opeens zo'n gevoel dat we in de halve finale gaan komen met de balbezit voor Frank de Boer. Frank de Boer speelt de bal. Heel goed naar Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp neemt de bal aan. Dennis Bergkamp. Frank de Boer. Frank de Boer speelt de bal. Speelt de bal. Heel goed naar Dennis. Heel goed naar Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Frank de Boer. Frank de Boer speelt de bal. Speelt de bal. Dennis Bergkamp. Dennis Bergkamp. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for listening, as always. It's hugely appreciated, as I'm sure you know, but for something like this, I don't think there's anything wrong with repeating myself week after week after week because it really does mean a great deal. Right, let's keep fingers crossed we can do the business against the Mug Smashers on Saturday evening. James and I will be here on Monday to talk about that on the Arsecast Extra. In the meantime, take it easy, folks. Have yourselves a great weekend. Until the next one, cheers. Bye-bye. So I got a call today from Gene Parmesan, our private eye. He said he found something big. We have a private eye, huh? Oh, I hired him a hundred years ago to find out if your father was cheating on me. He never did find anything. <laughs> well, he can't be very good then. Uh, what did he find? He said he wanted to tell us in person. Don't get up. I just find the supplies because I'm a private detective. Gene Parmesan, how are you doing? <laughs> Gene, isn't he the best? Gene was far from the best. Very impressive. Thank you.